A hundred years ago, long before television and mass tourism, there was only one way to see the world. Huge fairs were staged in every great city, bringing the world to the public. From Italian gondolas to African elephants. But it wasn't just animals and objects that were exhibited. Live human beings were put on display. These were human zoos. These exhibitions were not meant just as entertainments. They were masterminded by scientists and designed to demonstrate the superiority of the white race. The average white man is stronger of limb, fleeter of foot, clearer of eye than the average yellow or red or black. Human zoos taught the public that racism was scientific. This new science of race would inspire and feed the ideology of the Nazis, giving academic grounding to the 20th century's greatest atrocity. This is the story of the human zoos and their legacy, buried by history until now. Almost nothing is known about the people who were put in human zoos, but one man's story can be pieced together. His name was Otta Benga. He was a pygmy from the Congo. Otta Benga would pass through the hands of four of America's leading scientists. The anthropologist William McGee, the zoologist William Temple Horniday, and Madison Grant, America's greatest racist and the author of Hitler's favorite book. But Otto Benga's journey to the human zoo would begin with the explorer Samuel Phillips Werner. At the beginning of the 20th century, Werner was one of the world's leading experts on pygmies. He'd even lived among them in the Congo. My grandfather, he wanted to uh, show the world that there were these people and acquaint their civilization with ours. He thought that this would be sensational. I don't think my grandfather would have liked this environment. It's too artificial for him. I'm here to show you this uh, picture that was taken of my grandfather, Werner. I think he's a rather handsome fellow. Well, he was very adventurous. Uh, some thought it was to such an extreme that uh, perhaps he was a little daft or crazy or a little bit like many in the Werner family have been over the years. He saw the pygmies as people who were very close to nature and had a wonderful knowledge of who ate what and uh, how they uh, could cure diseases with various concoctions and how to poison an elephant. You realize a, a single pygmy could bring down an entire bull elephant single-handedly. I don't think that any of us could do that. In 1903, Werner got his chance to show pygmies to the world. I don't think it's in there now. I think it's in here. An anthropologist offered to pay him to bring pygmies to America. If he pulled off the feat, it could catapult Werner into the A-list of famous explorers, next to Stanley and Livingston. But first, he had to meet his employer's list of demands. Yeah, here we go. Here we are. Uh, what is to be procured? estimates of the cost. This is it. One pygmy patriarch or chief, one adult woman, preferably his wife, one adult man, preferably his son, one adult woman, the wife of the last or daughter of the first, one female youth unmarried, one female youth unmarried not nearly related to the last, two infants of women in the expedition, a priestess and a priest, or medicine doctors, preferably old. All of the above 12 to be pygmies. Oh, that's quite a, quite a list. Werner was actually thinking he could do this. But Werner's amazing adventure was not unique. A century ago, before we could travel the world as tourists, the only way we could witness how other races lived was to visit an ethnic show or human zoo. 
with live specimens that explorers had brought back for our entertainment. We're talking about millions of people going to see these shows when they're at their peak in terms of scale, in terms of cost, in terms of the amount of investment that's going into them. Human zoos were such a big draw that every major city had to stage one. Some of the most spectacular were in Paris, Chicago, Hamburg and London. In 1924, King George V and Queen Mary inspected the live exhibits at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley. Everyone wanted to be in on the act. Sometimes it's missionary people and they're putting on the shows to raise funds for missionary activity. Sometimes it's very much entrepreneurs taking advantage, being able to import people and just make a bit of money. Sometimes it's anthropologists and they claim it's for scientific reasons. So there's absolutely no doubt that there is such a thing as race and there's absolutely no shame or reluctance to talk about race. And the exhibits became ever more extravagant. Eventually, explorers' tales were brought to life by recreating entire villages. Originally, often you just get, for example, a show within a local theatre and you go along for a couple of hours. Whereas by the later 19th century, you can often have hundreds, if not a couple of thousand people on a single site eating and they're constantly on display. One of the most popular British exhibitions was held in 1899. It was called Savage South Africa. The natives were so keenly awaited that they were asked to perform to the crowds as soon as they stepped off the boat at Southampton Docks. By the time they made it to Earl's Court Exhibition Centre in London, their ringmasters were making them restage great battles from across the empire. So, for example, one thing that they do is reconstruct a raid by Africans um, during the Matebele Wars. And there's actually a film of this, and it's some of the earliest footage of Africans on film. And you've got the Dutchmen lined up, and you've got the Africans coming in and kind of <laughs> seeming to attack them. And it's very, very much in the vein of spectacular visual entertainment. In the end, the show proved almost too popular. Savage South Africa causes quite a stir because at one point women are banned from going into Earl's Court because they've supposedly been touching their natives. Scientists were also desperate to get their hands on the natives. At the end of the 19th century, academics were only just beginning to study humankind in scientific terms. This new science of anthropology saw human zoos as an opportunity to investigate humanity close up. Living labs where they could study all of the races in one place. One of the first American anthropologists spotted the potential of human zoos and set his sights on building the biggest and most popular human zoo ever with more human specimens than any other. His name was William McGee. McGee always had to do everything bigger more showy and just in your face, I am the best. He was a stubborn, ambitious individual, but he was also one of the greatest and most well-known scientists of the last century. McGee's human zoo would be more than spectacular public entertainment. McGee had a point to prove to the public. Those who know the races realize that the average white man is stronger of limb, fleeter of foot, clearer of eye, and far more enduring of body under stress of labor and hardship than the average yellow or red or black. Despite the special proficiency along a few narrow lines sometimes displayed by the lower types and drawn large in traveler's tail. What he wanted to do in St. Louis was show people how human beings had developed and how human cultures and races had developed. He decided to bring the extreme. He wanted to get the tallest people in the world, and he thought they were people from Patagonia, which is down at the tip of South America. Okay? 
since there was the tallest people in the world, he wanted the smallest people in the world. So he went over, he sent an expedition over to the Belgian Congo in that area to get pygmies. He wanted the Ainu, who were up in this island north of Japan, supposedly the hairiest people in the world. He also wanted the, what he considered the most primitive American Indian group, which was the Kokopa in Mexico. McGee wanted the Eskimo, people from South Africa. Logistically, it was a nightmare. The biggest nightmare belonged to McGee's special agent, the explorer and pygmy expert Samuel Phillips Werner. To bring back pygmies for McGee, he had to embark on a daredevil trip into the heart of Africa. He was just excited by every bit of it. He was that kind of a guy. If you told him that a place was dangerous, he'd say, I want to go there. I have here an old map showing the world as it was at the time my grandfather made his voyages to Africa. My grandfather got on board a ship uh, in in New York, first went to London, and then all the way down the European coast and around Africa to the Congo River. And he made his way up the Congo River with steamers as far as it would go. But once he arrived at the area where the great waterfalls were, he had to hire a crew of natives to take everything by hand up thousands of feet of waterfall country now he had to encounter uh, crocodiles and hippopotamuses that would upset the boats and some of the areas in the river they had great whirlpools that would, if you fell into them or your boat went into them, you would completely drown and you'd be thrown out on the side of a cliff somewhere. He did actually get malaria but he swore to the end of his days that he got that in the swamps of South Carolina, uh, not in Africa. But Werner's adventures would change the way the Western world saw race forever. In 1904, the anthropologist William McGee was putting the finishing touches to his human zoo. It was designed to be one of the largest scientific experiments ever undertaken. But before it had even begun, McGee was sure of the conclusion. It was designed to prove to the public that there was a hierarchy of races, with the white man at the top and everyone else beneath. McGee was trying to develop a universalizing theory of uh, human progress. And what he always did, and he always considered, like many other people at the time, was that no matter what you chose and what categories you use, whites were always, by definition, by default, better. <laughs> He thought that whites had progressed and that other groups were stuck in the past, in a sense, and hadn't developed as much as white civilization. McGee took Darwin's theory of evolution and bastardized it, creating a theory to explain the physical differences between races. Darwin saw humankind as one single species. McGee saw each race as a different stage in man's evolution from the pygmy at the bottom towards the white man at the top. Anthropologists still study pygmies today, and for good reasons. Why not be curious about the differences? So different places will have a very different culture and also very different biological adaptation to the particular environment. So of course, if you first met someone that is very different from you, this is something interesting. And the pygmies are very black, very curly hair, and very short. So when you see these differences, it's striking. Because they were so different to whites, McGee believed that pygmies were a living, missing link between apes and humans, the lowest rung of the evolutionary ladder. I think this is basically the influence of the culture of the time. Perhaps for the Victorian mind, you know, where men are always 
dressed and religion is very important and uh, the morals are very established. You cannot understand the place that the culture is completely different. So, yeah, it would be very uh, interesting to, to study them at that time, I think. Over in the Congo, the explorer Samuel Werner had been laid low for weeks with malaria. But he was about to come across the first of the pygmies on his shopping list. It was on an occasion when he was going up the Congo River and uh, the boat broke down, the steamboat. And the captain said it would take two weeks for the spare parts to come. And he was told by the captain that, uh, that he shouldn't go into this area. Uh, they should all stay on the boat until they got the parts to fix it. Uh, because there might be cannibals in the area. Well, that's all he had to tell my grandfather. And there were cannibals. And boy, he was out there in a minute uh, looking for them, wanting to talk to them, wanting to maybe share a meal with them. Who knows? And when he walked into one of their villages, he found that they had captured people in local tribal wars and were keeping them in cages. And some of them apparently uh, even preparing uh, for them to be eaten. That's when he encountered uh, his first uh, pygmy. My grandfather's first impressions were that the pygmy was a particularly fine specimen of the sort of people that he wanted to bring to St. Louis. And he asked the pygmy if he would like to go with him. The pygmy expressed that he'd rather take his chances with uh, uh, St. Louis than suffer being eaten by the cannibal tribe. My grandfather traded uh, a roll of brass wire and some salt for um, the pygmy's freedom. Uh, the pygmy's name was Otabenga. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think he had never seen white people before. And Werner offered him some water, and that sort of created an initial good impression. He spoke to Werner in his native Chaluba, which Werner understood could speak back. With Otto Benga's help, Werner managed to persuade five other pygmies to leave the Congo. Nearly six months after he started his mission, he was ready to make his return trip across the Atlantic. Once he got to Matadi, he could get on a steamer that took him directly over to the United States through New Orleans. They, they had a stop in Cuba, by the way, in Havana along the way, probably to pick up some cigars. The journey was pretty uneventful, and the, um, the pygmies probably thought it was a very long journey, much longer than, than they were used to. And they, they also wanted to know how the boat was powered. They thought that it had a cage full of hippopotamuses down beneath it that were pedaling it along. And Werner showed them how the steam engine worked. Mid-June, 1904, the pygmies caught their first glimpse of America. They docked to New Orleans. Now it was the pygmies' turn to explore. They marveled at the size of buildings, at the way the streets were laid out, and how complex things were, and how people had houses full of bright and beautiful things. So, it was very strange to them, but I don't think they had any fear. While Werner recovered from his malaria, he sent the pygmies to St. Louis by rail. Of course, that too was an amazing thing for them to, to be on a, on a railroad train. In St. Louis, the pygmies would be the anthropologist William McGee's most important example of an inferior race. But Werner, the explorer who'd lived among the pygmies, had come to a very different conclusion about them. Pioneering in Central Africa. Uh, the major book written by my grandfather. Let me look in the index, I, on the chapter on pygmies in here. Of one fact, my experience and observation completely convince me that these pygmies are human beings in every sense of the word. He lived among them, and so he knew about them. 
McGee's Human Zoo was to be the centerpiece of a giant international exhibition, the St. Louis World's Fair. Since 1851, World Fairs had been held across the globe to celebrate human progress. They showed off the latest in culture and new inventions. In St. Louis, the first ice cream cone and Dr. Pepper soft drink were unveiled to the world. The fair would last seven months, but today there's almost no trace left of this extravaganza. Well, we would be about at the center point of our fabulous fair right here. We would be standing right next to Festival Hall, which was the uh, huge auditorium with the huge dome larger than St. Peter's in Rome. People would come here and just take in the, the lovely view. And then below us is the Grand Basin. That would have been dotted with all sorts of gondolas, swan boats, little lagoons would go off to the side to some of the other palaces. Um, you could go around the fair on a, on a donkey. There were even people on a giant turtle. There was an Irish village, Tyrolean Alps. Actually, they were um, artificial mountains uh, that were constructed in the background. 20 million people visited our fair, so every day there would be hundreds of thousands of people here. But in this celebration of human progress, McGee's 2,000 human exhibits were going to steal the show. His plan was coming together. He had already assembled 300 Filipinos. The Patagonian giants were on a boat from Liverpool to New York. 400 barbarian Igorots and Negritos were stranded in San Francisco waiting for the weather to clear. The hairy Ainu from Japan were making their way from Vancouver. But the most eagerly awaited were the pygmies. African pygmies for the World Fair. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, June 26, 1904. Here are some queer facts about African pygmies. They live in forests. They are extremely shy. They eat the flesh of wild animals killed with poison arrows. They're extremely cunning and dexterous. They're cruel, finding delight in torturing animals. They have long heads, long narrow faces. And little red eyes, set close together like those of ferrets. Their bodies are exceptionally hairy. A pygmy has been known to eat 60 bananas at one meal, in addition to other foods, and then ask for more. If caught young, they are said to make excellent servants. They seem to be controlled by an impulse that makes them delight in wickedness. McGee's exhibits would spend months living in an enclosure on the fairground. He wanted them to recreate their lives at home. They built houses, cooked authentic foods, kept animals they brought with them, performed traditional ceremonies and dances, and they wandered amongst the other exhibits. For visitors to the fair, it seemed as if the whole world had come to St. Louis, and the anthropological lessons were clear. In many ways, it was a cool idea. The visitors would come and see contrasts. And so this is the people from Patagonia. And so you can see he wears shoes, and he's got um, trousers on and um, suspenders. So the pygmies would be more savage in this scheme of McGee's because they're partially naked. McGee thought that the um, pygmies looked like gorillas. They had a darker skin, which looked like gorillas, dark, dark hair, or a chimpanzee's dark hair. Um, they also had some ceremonies that would imitate the sounds of chimpanzees. But for McGee, it wasn't just the pygmies' appearance that betrayed their inferior racial type, but their behavior. They had a certain kinds of religions that were thought to be really primitive. Here, they're illustrating a uh, ceremonial decapitation now probably the visitors would just, and you can see a couple of visitors in the back there, would probably think this is just a primitive rite, and they would take it as a sign of savageness, rather than looking and seeing that they were performing rituals that, 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 say, similar to Catholics would do in churches and things like that. As the fair went on, Otta Benga began to draw the most attention. He was described in the press as a dwarfy black specimen of sad-eyed humanity. But the pygmy was turning performer. 
he used to get um, paid to smile for photographs and would get five cents and 25 cents and sign his autograph, which is how they made money there. The pygmies turn out to be great entrepreneurs, and they saw this as a diplomatic mission. It had nothing to do with racial categories. They were on a mission to the United States to demonstrate and to show Americans how cultured and civilized they were. They didn't realize that McGee was putting up signs that said they were savages. It never occurred to them. No matter what his subjects thought, McGee was able to draw the conclusions he wanted from his anthropological experiment. The results are contained in his original report. It's been hidden away for the best part of a century, rarely recovered from the archives. He was described by McGee in his, in his report as very typical because he was exactly the right height that everybody thought pygmies should be. And because he was the right skin color, and because he had filed teeth, it basically reinforced the stereotypes that people came to the fair with. So he became the archetype, the model, the perfect one. In his report, McGee seems to have had no doubt that the pygmies were every bit as savage as he'd imagined. But as the fair went on, the pygmies were unwittingly frustrating all of McGee's theories. The pygmies used to go out and one of their favorite things to do was buy cigars. Um, they would get cigars every day and one of the people in the Turkish pavilion would give it to them. And McGee used to get mad because pygmies are too primitive to smoke cigars. Therefore, he would take those away. In fact, the newspapers called him the overlord of the savage world. And then all the pygmies had top hats and they used to wear them all the time. And that didn't coincide with the pictures and what they wanted to present at the fair. For McGee, the misbehavior of the pygmies was the final straw. He believed his anthropological experiment had been scuppered and that he'd failed to gather enough evidence for the superiority of the white race. A year after the fair, he would turn his back on humans and choose to study rocks instead. But by the time the fair closed in December 1904, and the savages were on their way home. Twenty million people had passed through its gates, and most went away believing that anthropology had publicly demonstrated that the white race was superior. For them, racism had been given a scientific seal of approval, and scientific racism was now set to change the course of the 20th century. For almost a year, Otta Benga and the other pygmies had lived in America, exhibits in a human zoo. In 1905, the explorer Samuel Phillips Werner took them back to their home in the Congo. But Otta Benga found that he had no home to go back to. He thought he would rejoin his tribe, which he found had been completely eliminated. So Werner suggested that maybe he would get along with the Batois, and he, in fact, married a young woman from the Batois. And uh, she got bitten by a poisonous snake and died. And then the Batois rejected him as being a bad influence on them. He felt a stranger. He felt like he was not accepted in his own land anymore. Otta Benga begged Werner to take him back to America. Werner definitely did not want to do this. But uh, Otta Benga threatened to um, jump in the river and be eaten by crocodiles if Werner didn't take him back to America, which he thought was St. Louis. And Werner had to explain to him, no, there's a bigger city called New York, and that's where we're going. Werner and Otta Benga left for America within weeks. This time, they made the 3,000-mile journey via Liverpool, Transporting crates of live animals, parrots, monkeys, and snakes, Werner had his hands full. But Otto Benga found no trouble passing the time. Otto Benga discovered cigarettes on the steamship, and he kept going to the uh, counter where cigarettes and whiskey were sold, and uh, imbibed at his pleasure and gave the bill to Werner. 
But Werner's hoard of African artifacts failed to sell in New York, and he had to head to the south to ask his relatives for money. But Otto Benga seemed to be settling into life in the city. He was amazed at the height of the buildings. He was amazed at all the things that were amazed about it in New York. At one point when he was taken to the Hippodrome to see a society circus, he saw the baby elephant handing out programs. And he thought that was wonderful that, that the elephant had found a place to be engaged in some useful activity. And uh, he started talking to the elephant. And the crowd was amazed that he could actually get the elephant to do things, which astounds me even to this day. Otta Benga imagined that he'd also be able to make a go of it in New York. Werner arranged accommodation for him in the American Museum of Natural History, where he thought Otto Benga would at least be safe. I think my grandfather saw Otto Benga living a life as a, as, as a, a performer, if you will. Uh, perhaps that's not the best life in the world, but at least it's, uh, it's better than being eaten alive uh, in Africa. But almost as soon as Werner left New York, other people began making plans for the pygmy. While living at the museum, Otta Benga came to the attention of William T. Hornaday, a conservationist who'd saved the American bison and was now the director of the Bronx Zoo. Hornaday offered to take Otta Benga off the museum's hands. He thought he was going to look after the zoo's elephants, but instead, he was going to be put back on public display. The exhibition was that of a human being in a monkey cage. New York Times, September 9th, 1906. A human being in a monkey cage. A human being happened to be a Bushman. One of a race that scientists do not rate high in the human scale. But to the average non-scientific person in the crowd of sightseers... There was something about the display that was unpleasant. It is probably a good thing that Benga doesn't think very deeply. If he did, it isn't likely that he was very proud of himself. When he woke in the morning and found himself under the same roof... With the orangutans and the monkeys. For that is where he really is. On September the 8th, 1906, Hornaday put Otta Benga on display in the monkey house with a chimpanzee for a playmate. The sign read, The Missing Link. The entire episode had been swept under the carpet, but Anne Hornaday recently discovered the story. It was her great-uncle William T. Hornaday who had arranged the exhibition. When I first heard about it, I was appalled. And I asked my father about it, and he did remember hearing about this episode, um, and remembered his mother being very uh, upset about it. It was a public sensation. On a single day, 40,000 people turned up to see Otta Benga and the chimp. Bushman shares cage with Bronx Park apes. Some laugh over his antics, many are not pleased. So, you know, it's not as if this went un unremarked, and it didn't go uncriticized. And I think that's important to remember, too. The exhibition lasted only two weeks. African-American church ministers insisted that Otta Benga be released, not because the exhibition was racist, but because they thought the pygmy should be converted to Christianity. Otta Benga was now on offer to anyone who'd take him. Uh, an asylum in Brooklyn had called, um, an African-American group, charitable group, had called asking to bring him out there. Colored orphan home gets the pygmy. <clears throat> Otta Benga has left the New York Zoological Park in the Bronx and has been installed in the Howard Colored Orphan Asylum. Bean Street and Troy Avenue, Brooklyn. There it is hoped that by association with the colored children and their instructors, the pygmy may, may be civilized so that when he goes back home, he will be able to teach his people. Although an adult, Otta Benga was confined to an orphanage, hidden away from a public who had queued to see him. Exhibiting Otta Benga at the zoo, 
had been designed not as a mere sideshow. The display had been masterminded by a man called Madison Grant, a wealthy conservationist who had founded the Bronx Zoo. He was also one of America's greatest racists. He had decided to put Otterbenga on display to educate the masses about scientific racism. When Madison Grant died in 1937, it is said that his family burned all of his papers. His remaining legacy is a book. A rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years. Race feeling may be called prejudice by those whose careers are cramped by it, but it is a natural antipathy which serves to maintain the purity of type. If the melting pot is allowed to boil without control and deliberately blind ourselves to all distinctions of race, creed, or color, the type of Native American of colonial descent will become as extinct as the Athenian in the age of Pericles and the Viking in the days of Rollo. So what is this book that you're reading? This book is The Passing of the Great Race by Madison Grant, a classic of American racist literature. The Passing of the Great Race was a bestseller when it was first published in 1916. It promoted the idea that the survival of the white master race, the Nordics as Grant called them, was threatened by the lower races. So they had to be kept apart. Although Grant was only an amateur anthropologist, he was highly influential. He was a player. He was an insider. He hobnobbed with the big scientists, and the big scientists agreed with him. This is someone who was a Yale graduate at Columbia Law School, um, and with the luxury of not having to work for a living because he was independently wealthy, um, he devoted himself full-time to um, uh, early conservation, for which his work is generally admired, um, and early anthropology, to which, of course, for which, of course, is not admired. Grant, a eugenicist, argued that evolution should not be left to chance. He lobbied for laws banning interracial marriages and limiting immigration, laws passed by people softened up by human zoos and now susceptible to Grant's arguments. The cross between a white man and an Indian is an Indian. The cross between a white man and a Negro is a Negro. The cross between a white man and a Hindu is a Hindu. And the cross between any of the three European races and a Jew is a Jew. When I read my students Madison Grant and I read it angrily, um, my students say, why do you take such a personal interest in this? And I say, well, because it was my grandparents and great-grandparents that he was trying to keep out of the United States. It is a very personal story. To, for, for most Americans, in fact. Grant's argument found followers all over the world. In 1930, after the passing of the great race was translated into German, Grant was bestowed with what he regarded as one of his greatest honors. He received a fan letter from an aspiring politician in Germany, which said, your book is my Bible, signed Adolf Hitler. Um, Grant's Correspondence has disappeared. That letter is not with us anymore. Um, but there is eyewitness testimony that he brandished this letter uh, at, at people to show how great and how influential both he was and how seriously the Germans were taking his ideas, which is something he was proud of. He was a real <laughs> by the way. Put that on your television. <laughs> Three years after Hitler sent his letter to Madison Grant, he seized power in Germany and turned his hero's ideas into policy. Once the Nazis adopted it and embraced it wholeheartedly, that caused a lot of Americans, although not all Americans, um, to rethink it. Some American scientists were saying things like, hey, the Germans are beating us at our own game, and uh, this is a bad thing. Uh, we need to get more like them. So there, there is a dirty little history there that um, we do need to bring out into the open. The Nazis set about using scientific racism as the foundation of the Third Reich. 
They took the ideas that were promoted in human zoos further than anyone else, instituting a systematic elimination of inferior races in the defense of their own superior Aryan race. In the end, they slaughtered millions in the name of scientific racism, an idea for which Otto Benga has been used as a prime example. Guilty or not guilty? In 1947, at the Nuremberg War Trials, Nazi doctors named Grant and his book in their defense, arguing that the Third Reich had merely been copying American ideas. Military Tribunal 1 has found and has judged you guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and sentences you to death by hanging, and may God have mercy upon your soul. In the wake of the Holocaust, mixing race and science became taboo. The ideas of Madison Grant and the early anthropologists were buried. Since the Nazi atrocities of World War II, talking about racial difference has become taboo. How does it make you feel talking about this stuff? Me? It's not something that particularly means much to me. We have been accustomed to race as evil and sex as dirty. Is there such a thing as race? I don't hate any races. I don't fear many races. And um, I think there's a difference between recognizing racial differences and fearing or hating them. I have to think a lot to kind of say what I think about it. Racism would exist whether or not um, races are real. There are large individual differences within a race, but um, I, I, I don't think I could play basketball as well as uh, a well-trained uh, African-American, uh, and I'd I wonder if a well-trained African-American could uh, do uh, plasma physics as well as I do. Isn't that racist? Yes, it's racist. I, didn't, I never said I wasn't a racist. There have been no human zoos since the 1940s. Today's anthropologists still study differences between humans, but reach very different conclusions. Of course, there are differences across continents, right? If you go to Asia, it's clearly different from Africa, it's clearly different from Europe, and people vary in skin color, in hair type, in body size, in fatness, in all sorts of things. And this is related to the particular adaptations to the environment. So you see that probably it's good to have dark skin if you are in a tropical country. But this is not fixed. So this doesn't make a race, right, in terms of what was implied in the past, was that the, the different races had different cognitive capacities as well. And this is not true. People are very flexible, very intelligent, and very able to adapt. So does race exist? Or? I don't think so, no. I, don't, I wouldn't call race. I would call just diversity. We are not really allowed to talk about these differences nowadays I think but talking about them is actually good to understand better what's what are humans as, as a species how we are similar and how we are different as well and this doesn't mean worse or better because race became taboo after the Nazis even 60 years on we're still confused about what it is unwilling to mention it unable to tell what's racist, leaving us blind to what science could tell us about race. But what of Otta Benga, the pygmy who at the beginning of the 20th century was displayed as a living example of racial inferiority? Otto Benga was kept out of the public eye for four years. He eventually ended up in an unlikely little backwater, Lynchburg, Virginia. There are no memorials to him here, but he was adopted by some of the locals, and a few still know of him.
my husband, Chauncey Edward Spencer, used to speak about this strange person, Atabinga. So the only thing that I can tell you about Atabinga is what I have heard from my husband. He was four years old when he and Atabinga played. And uh, the things that he would tell would be just what most boys would talk about, how they would hunt, how he taught them to hunt, and things of that nature. But to my knowledge, he never spoke of his homeland or anything. In Lynchburg, Otto Benga became known as Otto Bingo. He had his pointed teeth capped and attended a Baptist seminary where he started to study English. I never knew him, but from what I hear from other people talking about him, it's always very nice. It's like he was a young boy lost and uh, in the woods. I don't think he would have ever been happy without returning to his homeland. I really don't. For the next few years, Otta Benga worked in a tobacco factory, apparently trying to save enough money to return to the Congo. I could talk on and on, but eventually I guess the whole world would know about this small pygmy man that never dreamed of living in a strange town like Lynchburg, Virginia. He'll be in the books and kids will read about that there are other people who look different, but they still are human beings. But Otta Benga never did make it home. He died in Lynchburg in 1916, ten years after he'd been on show at the Bronx Zoo. In the end, Otta Benga may have realized that he'd never be fully accepted as a human being, that he was just too different. Local records show that one night, in the barn behind the general store, he removed the caps from his teeth and then killed himself with a shotgun. Nobody knows for certain where he's buried, but local resident Laura Munson thinks she's found the likely spot, an unmarked grave at the White Rock Cemetery. Well, I just sort of accidentally found this place and I kept seeing this cemetery uh, on a map. I had to do some historic research on it and so every day I'd drive around and I couldn't couldn't find it. Finally I stopped uh, up here at Miss Smith's house and asked her if she knew about a cemetery out here. She said, oh yes, it's in my backyard. You see those uh, those four corner post with the chains going from one to the other. That's where it is. Nobody really accepted him. He was a pygmy, but he wasn't that short. There were persons who really did try to embrace him and treat him, and treat him with some dignity and some respect. But I'm sure there were others who just maybe saw him as a novelty. <laughs>